Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're about to get started. The first item on the agenda will be the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to let folks know that in regard to our schedule for next year, next year, next week, we do have um, a board meeting um, as a TBD. Um, so I would just recommend just checking our website um, in order to see what is uh, on our agenda for next week or if we do not have a meeting uh, that is really to be determined. And our press release and our board schedule for January will be out in the next week or so. And um, just wanted to wish everyone happy holidays. Thank you, Susan. Um, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of 1216 and 1218. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday 1216 and Friday 1218 without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying no. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is a discussion of the um, Medicare benchmark proposal, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh. Sarah? Gosh, it's hard to find your mute button um, sometimes. Good morning. Is you technology people. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Can't trust us. Um, so good morning. Thank you for taking time to consider a vote on the 2021 Medicare benchmark. Uh, the, there was no public comment received in the public comment period. So the proposal is for uh, performance year 2021 to use a retrospective trend factor uh, for the benchmarks for the ACO and that we will include advanced savings uh, in the amount that is advised in the budget process, which I think is about 8.6 million, but um, they have all the details on that. So. Uh, that's just a mechanism by which to fund those uh, savings or uh, to help fund some programs in the state. So any questions before we uh, consider a vote? Questions from the board? If not, we may just want to open it up to public comment um, just in case any member of the public has comment at this time. We haven't received any, but um, does anyone from the public wish to comment on the Medicare benchmark proposal before we take a vote? Hearing none, is there a board member who's prepared to make a motion? I yes, see you shaking I, your head, Robin. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, so I move that we propose to the Center on Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that for the 2021 performance year, the Vermont Next Generation ACO program use a retrospective trend factors reflecting the observed changes in actual per beneficiary expenditures between 2021 and 2020 for the ESRD and non-ESRD Vermont Medicare beneficiaries eligible for attribution to the ACO and an advanced shared savings component um, in the amount determined in the budget process. Is there a second? Second. second. And Tom, could you repeat the motion? <laughs> Just kidding. I cannot. Just kidding. <laughs> I, I, so at, good. Every, at, at every meeting, I'm so thankful for Robin. <laughs> well, motions are hard to craft. I Is there any discussion? Know. Hearing none, all those in favor of the proposal signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was a four to nothing vote. Um, and uh, it was unanimous, but uh, we have one member absent today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, now I'm going to um, turn it over to Elena Barabee and Marissa Melamed. 
um, for continuing discussion on the um, ACO um, budget for the, the coming year. And um, Elena and Marissa, um, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Chair Mullen. I will be sharing my screen. Let me know when you can see that. We can see it. Great. Um, so Elena Barabee, Director of Health System Policy, and Marissa Melamed. Um, we are here to hopefully um, also um, a potential vote on the ACO budget. So uh, today we'll talk about the process to date briefly, follow up to the 1218 presentation, um, outline some public comment that were um, submitted since the 129 uh, conversation, and then review staff recommendations and budget order conditions, next steps, again, public comment, um, and then a potential board vote. So how did we get here? Um, we, you know, you've seen the staff recommendations over the last couple of weeks. Um, we incorporated relevant FY20 budget order conditions and considered the new recommendations. Um, we incorporated board feedback, public comment um, to arrive at today's budget order conditions that we will be presenting to you um, um, subsequently. So those recommendations that did not end up in the subsequent slides could have been um, added either to the reporting manual that we discussed um, or are going to be part of the um, our recommendations for the FY 2022 um, budget order uh, guide guidance. So, you know, we can follow up on that at a later date, but all the recommendations we kind of carried forward in, in one of these mechanisms. Today, we'll focus on the FY 21 budget order conditions. So um, in follow-up to the discussions on the 18th, One Care sent a letter on the 21st, clarifying information on their proposed plan related to the blueprint funds flow and the desired Medicare trend rate for the advanced shared savings component of the 2021 benchmark. Um, we also received a public comment, which we note later from AHS that we um, asked for their um, opinion on this matter. Um, and we took forward both of those considerations and, and incorporated them into the proposal today. Um, as well as you know some of the board conversation that we've had to date on this matter. In terms of public comment received, we received five additional public comment, one of those um, being the AHS um, comments on the blueprint for health. Those are posted to our website. And now we can go briefly through each of the budget order conditions. There are 17 in total, so I won't read them here because they will be discussed in each subsequent slide, but you know, um, the first condition talks about um, what I referred to earlier about moving some of the reporting requirements to a reporting manual. That way we can kind of standardize and think about these things as an ongoing um, kind of monitoring program rather than tied to a specific budget order. This will allow us to um, foster continuous improvement um, in this area, um, but it would cover things such as network development, attribution, payer programs, um, their financials, administrative expenses, risk population health. So any kind of reporting requirement could be specified and included in this guide um, going forward. The second budget order condition is related to scale target um, ACO initiatives. Uh, so this is an updated condition for FY21. So to the greatest extent possible, uh, One Care must design payer programs to qualify as scale target ACO initiatives. If they don't, they have to provide justification to the Green Mountain Care Board for why it wouldn't be a scale target qualifying program. So this is pretty much a um, holding over from a prior year, just a couple tweaks, but substantively it's the same requirement. The third budget order condition um, is an updated condition from 21 that discusses the trend rates for each of the payer programs. Um, as Sarah mentioned, the, the Medicare benchmark, the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative, the trend factors, um, we would expect that the budget um, would reflect trend factors proposed by the board and approved by CMS. So that's through the benchmark process. Uh, the Medicaid Next Generation ACO program, those factors should be consistent with the recommendations um, through the board's Medicaid advisory rate case. And then on the commercial uh, programs, the 21 benchmark trend rates for commercial programs must be consistent with ACO attributed population um, and the GMCB approved rate filings. So these are all generally consistent. I think the difference here is that we don't include some of the uh, factors to allow for kind of the pandemic associated process <laughs> adjustments. But um, you know, we don't have any concerns about hitting the all pair model kind of total cost of care targets. Um, but we do want to make sure that 
um, the ACO's budget is reflective of these other processes uh, going forward. We also um, kept some of the language around actuarial certification um, and you know, this pointing to the all-payer model um, kind of targets and growth. So just for consistency's sake, we want to make sure that that continues to live in the budget order. Uh, condition number four is an updated condition from FY21. Um, this states that the maximum risk amount that one care may assume um, is as follows. So there were reductions to the risk corridors across many of their programs due to the pandemic pandemic this year uh, to allow continued participation um, despite some of the financial constraints experienced by um, providers. So this um, memorializes those uh, reductions in risk um, in, this, in this condition. The risk model um, is an updated condition for 21 but has some new elements. Uh, so one care must implement the risk model that is described in its budget proposal and must request and receive approval from the board prior to making material adjustments. Um, so they must continue to submit copies to the board of the contracts that bind each of the risk bearing hospitals to one care's risk sharing policy. Uh, they must notify and seek approval from the board as early as possible for any of the proposed changes. Um, however, this year, I mean, I think there's still a little bit of uncertainty about how the risk model um, methodologies will work, and then specifically as it relates to the 10% performance incentive pool or any other market factor adjustments or potential adjustments to shared savings or losses. So we would uh, request those additional details by the March 31st deadline, which is consistent with um, their submission of the revised budget. Um, so all of those dates are correlated, but I think we can talk about what the right timeline is based on kind of how the contracting process and other related processes may unfold. Um, and then, you know, if if we need to, we can have them come in and discuss um, the details of the risk model and kind of those final components on April 15th. The revised budget, this condition, um, it was updated for 21. I believe many of the same kind of the content is still pretty much the same, but you know there may be additional asks depending on kind of where we land um, in this budget order for what we ask them to come provide updates on. So as always, any other information the board deems relevant um, can be requested um, for this presentation in April. Uh, budget order condition number seven is related to the revised budget presentation, but we um, request that all supporting materials are provided by March 31st. This allows staff time to review the materials um, prior to the presentation so we can assist in formulating any questions or analysis that may be necessary. Um, and we've detailed here many of um, the same kind of deliverables associated with the previous condition um, and then attached a couple additional requirements related to recommendations so i'll just point those out um you know we'd like the source of funds for the population health management programs for 2021 um quantification of the value-based incentive fund so we understand there's some differences in how that's being operationalized this year so i think we need some additional information on you know how much value-based um you know how much value-based uh how many value-based dollars are still going through the system um, controlling for the timing of when those funds would be doled out. Um, and then OneCare's most recent strategic plan, um, if that's not prepared by March 31st, you know, we'll work with OneCare to figure out what the right timeline is. We understand this is something they're working on um, in the near future. And then any other information the board deems relevant. All right, administrative expenses, and then I'll turn it over to Marissa. So, on administrative expenses, you know, we propose two options so far. I think we, we added this third option um, really because we weren't, we didn't feel satisfied with the first two options. So, um, you know, what we did first is kind of signal that delivery system reform funding and the blueprint self-management contract are not certain um, revenue sources or expenditures. So, you know, if that, if those not, do not materialize, we would expect um, a revised budget submission that can be consistent with the March 31st deadline. Um, in addition to that, I think it would be helpful to get um, some benchmark information on salaries and benefits as we do in many of our other regulatory processes. Um, and as you know, we've struggled with how to think about the, you know, the magnitude of administrative expenses at One Care this year. And I believe it was disappointing to see a budget um, that reflected, you know, the sentiment that the pandemic 
was not yet over, even though we know that there are still many ongoing um, kind of concerns around the pandemic. You know, we've met with state legislators and, and the outlook is not looking good. You know, there's no federal relief coming at the state level. People are hurting and we really need mission-based people um, to be leading our healthcare reform efforts. You know, and moving away from fee-for-service and towards value-based care is a nod to recognizing the need to continue moving away um, from seeing healthcare as a business and embracing it as a public good. So one that needs to be delivered at high quality and efficiently. Um, so in the spirit of value-based care and ensuring that there's accountability across the system, we're proposing option three um, that would tie executive compensation to ACOI performance on finance and quality. So that is new, but we believe consistent with many of the recommendations um, provided by AHS, as well as um, Green Mountain Care Board staff, and believe that this would you know, bolster um, our progress moving forward. So I'll turn it over to Marissa now. Good afternoon and thank you, Elena. So number nine is regarding ACO reserves. Uh, the discussion around reserves this year focused on one cares net assets as of the end of 2019 and 2020. In our December 18th presentation, we recommended to include in future budget guidance and the reporting manual requirements for one care to report on any changes to its reserves and justification for any growth or disbursement including one care Vermont's board approved amount um, and date of the board approval. For the budget approval, we landed here with this condition, which is um, basically just an update of the condition that uh, was in the FY20 budget, um, which allows, um, well, tells one care um, with use of the reserve that it must notify the board within 15 days of the use. Notification must include the reason for drawing down the reserve. Um, for any use that's authorized under this condition with a corresponding cash flow analysis and the use of the reserve is limited to additional funding for population health investments, financial backing for risk incurred by participating providers. Um, C is what we added new for this year, which is maintaining ACO-wide risk on behalf of participating providers. Um, this is to allow for more risk sharing options. Um, the temporary cash flow issues associated with payer revenue delays um, or other is, uh, other uses approved by the board. You can go to slide 10. Population health management program. So the condition here is the same as in 2020. This condition acknowledges that contracts and funding sources are not yet finalized for population health management programs. So final funding needs to be submitted with the budget resubmission in the spring. Um, including a description of budget revisions and changes to programs, including funding shortfalls or changes in scope. We also ask for an analysis to understand which programs can grow with attribution or other factors. Uh, we're looking for growth and investment because these programs are a way of redistributing dollars toward clinical community programs that improve health and reduce costly services, but we can't force the growth without a plan for scaling up or uh, without demonstrated results. So we also do monitor these programs through reporting from OneCare on their evaluation of the effectiveness of these programs. Uh, this report was a condition last year and will be updated through the reporting manual. Um, but as for the condition, we landed here. Uh, and you can move to number 11. 11 is regarding blueprint for health and SASH funding. So this is an updated condition for fiscal year 21. A couple of things happened here since December 18th. Uh, we recommended adding the Medicare growth trend of 3.5% to the blueprint and SASH funding and requiring the payment design be consistent with the medical home and community health scheme program payment design approved by the Agency of Human Services. Uh, this would allow for the additional dollars to be directed to Medicare participating hospital blueprint practices. Um, however, during the December 18th meeting, there was discussion around using the maximum Medicare trend factor of 4.35% and specifically trending the SASH funding forward in the same at the same rate as the blueprint. So those changes are reflected in the updated proposed budget condition here. Um, also that Sarah Lindberg alluded to in the benchmark presentation. You can go to slide 12 or condition 12. Uh, condition 12, um, calling here demonstrated value of One Care Vermont. We've also referred to this as ROI. Um, 
either way. Um, we did not change this condition. This has been in previous budget orders uh, as presented on December 9th. The Green Mountain Care Board analytics team is working on two studies to help evaluate this condition. Um, project one um, is, looks at changes to provider outcomes, look, answering or looking at the question, does one care change provider outcomes? Project two, um, return on PHM investment, uh, looking at the question, what is the return on investment of one care's PHM investment? So we expect to collaborate with one care and stakeholders on the inputs of these studies and report progress to the board. Again, um, this um, condition which has been in previous orders is looking at over the duration of the APM agreement. Um, so we did not recommend any changes. Condition 13, uh, slide 20 on audited financials. This condition is updated based on staff recommendations discussed on December 9th. Uh, prior budget, the prior budget order required one care to submit audited financials. This year, we are asking them to crosswalk the audited financials, um, which are um, based on GAAP principles or generally accepted accounting principles. We're asking them to crosswalk that um, financial uh, submission to the budget as submitted, um, which includes the pass through or what we call accountability dollars. This is needed. Be because it is important for the Green Mountain Care Board to verify that One Care Vermont has complied with its budget order for a particular year. And because um, budgets um, and actuals are submitted in different format, that's the budget for accountability, um, than the audited financials, which are gap based. So there's no current way for staff to ensure that the audited financials tie back to the budget order. In addition, the audits aren't timely. They come almost 12 months after the end of the year, so we cannot monitor throughout the year, and this recommendation would help. Um, our staff recommendation here, as discussed in previous presentation, also includes requirements that we add the gap-based um, budget requirement to the guidance in future years. Next slide, which is 21, in condition 14, uh, the One Care Analytic Demonstration. So Green Mountain Care Board staff and board members did this for certification back in 2018. We had different staff, different board members um, at the time, at least several of us were including this condition for 2021 as it's time to, for a refresh. This recommendation also aligns with activities that are identified in the AHS Implementation Improvement Plan. Next slide, condition 15. Um, is a new condition for fiscal year 21, um, looking at the discussion around increasing fixed perspective payments. So the board looks at percentage of fixed perspective payments in the ACO and hospital budget process. Uh, this is a key metric for understanding where the system is and moving out of the um, what's called the foot in two canoes scenario of having both uh, fee-for-service and value-based payments and providers working under both systems at the same time. So to move away from re revenue generated through volume, more payments are needed through fixed perspective payments. Um, the ACO is our vehicle for achieving that um, transition through partnerships with payers. So we are looking um, for one care to work with the payers uh, to propose a timeline or a plan for, for working um, for these higher levels of FPP, and we monitor that um, through reporting. <clears throat> the next, um, and we're almost toward the end, um, condition 16, adjustment of dates. So we do recognize, as mentioned before, that there's uncertainty around dates in these conditions. This happens every year um, around contract ex execution and uncertainties. Also the One Care Board of Manager meeting dates where they um, approve um, different uh, things that we then need to review. So we did put dates in here to keep our eye on the ball. They roughly align with previous years. However, we know that um, these dates have to be adjusted. So this condition delegates authority to adjust those dates to the Director of Health Systems Policy. That's uh, Elena's position. Um, and so that's, that's so that we can work with One Care more smoothly to meet the requirements of the budget condition and adjust dates as needed without having One Care be out of compliance with their order. Finally, condition 17, further orders. This is a standard condition in previous orders um, that after notice and opportunity to be heard, the board may make such further orders as are necessary to carry out the purposes of this order and 18 BSA 9382. Before we move to uh, board questions, 
discussion and public comment. I'm just going to review the next steps in our process. Um, if you, if the board is ready, you are able to vote on these conditions today, December 23rd. Um, we then work with legal to issue a formal budget order in early 2021. That usually comes out end of January or early February. Um, as discussed, once with ex once contracts are executed, we have final attribution. The ACO will um, submit and present on their revised or adjusted budget in spring 2021. Um, and then staff will immediately begin working on incorporating recommendations that have been made into our FY21 reporting manual. And then we get to begin the cycle all over again um, with our FY22 budget guidance development. Um, and this happens between January and spring. Um, of course, the guidance is issued early in the summer and um, we start the cycle again. Um, so that completes our review of the budget order conditions. Um, I can turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, for board questions, discussion, and public comment. Thank you, Marissa and Elena. Um, I'm going to um, try to uh, make this as efficient as possible. And before going to board comments or questions, ask for comment from um, One Care Vermont on the recommendations that they've seen. And I would hope that at that point, um, when the board does ask questions of staff, they might also be able to ask a question of, of One Care on specific points. So, Vicki, is that okay if I uh, put you on the spot and ask you for your comments? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm I'm in a new location, so I'm always unclear whether or not I'm coming through or not. Um, we so can thank hear you and see you. All right, awesome. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to give some comments and feedback. I think our collective staff have been working very closely over the last couple of weeks, as well as um, with the Agency of Human Services to get closer um, on the overall budget orders. Because as you all know, um, many of our contracts are contingent um, on the budget orders. And so we'd like to get those closed out um, before our board meets on the 29th. So I have three areas that I'd like to provide some comment on. The first is around the admin. Um, I just wanna remind folks, and I know that we put this in our letter, that the budget that we are proposing this year is actually about $3 million less than the one that was proposed and approved last year. And that um, OneCare has expanded uh, substantially. And as you all know, um, no one has done this type of reform work in the past, so it's not like we are a extremely mature organization where there's a clear path laid forward. There's a lot of um, hard work um, to be able to, to move this forward, and it's not always simple work. It's very complicated. Um, I'd also like to remind the members of the Green Mountain Care Board that One Care has made significant cuts um, in its budget this year as a result of COVID, up to about six million dollars reduction in our overall budget. So I would say that One Care has been acting very responsibly um, and making sure that the financial situation of those who are making the investments in One Care, i.e., the hospitals. Um, have the support that they need to be able to enter into these value-based contracts while understanding um, that um, their finances are stressed during a time of COVID. So I don't think that was fully appreciated or recognized in the staff's comment. So I wanted to make sure to bring that to your attention. Our board has deliberated extensively on One Care's budget. All the investors, um, meaning the hospitals that are part of One Care, have helped to develop this budget, and they believe that it is what is necessary to help them be successful and to meet all the requirements that we have of our multiple payer contracts. So, making um, significant reductions in that arena would um, potentially cause disruption in our ability to carry forward the model as 
as intended. I also, um, that's all I have to say on the administrative budget piece of it. I also wanted to add that we do support an overall trend increase of the 4.35 but only to the hospitals that are participating and bearing the risk in the Medicare program. And I just want to give some context as to why this is our overall position. I think historically, the way this model has worked is that the ACO participants received a benchmark and then they received a trend rate increase that was equal to the trend rate increase that was being received by the Blueprint and the SASH participants. In 2020 and 2021, ACO participants will not be re receiving a 4.35% increase. Therefore, the risk is asymmetrical and it will be borne by those hospitals that are participating. That's why we are only in favor of providing those increases in trends to the hospitals that are bearing the risk. We believe this is a modest incentive to those who are stepping forward to help the state meet their scale targets goals and not, re not unrealistic um, given the financial situations that they are in right now. And the third thing I just wanted to comment on was in terms of providing a timeline for the fixed payment for commercial. I think that we would be short-sighted if we didn't recognize that the real fixed payment we need is with Medicare, that right now it is essentially a reconciled fee-for-service, and we will not be able to meet our Medicare benchmarks as a state until that gets corrected. So I think that needs to be, first and foremost, one of the recommendations that the state and OneCare will be working with the federal government to really get to a true fixed payment because we are not there yet. So that's that's my only comment and I thank you very much for the opportunity to provide that comment and feedback. And myself, Sarah and Tom are here if you have additional questions as you deliberate on the on the budget orders. So my apologies up front, Vicki. I uh, was busy um, writing down your comments on um, slides eight and uh, um, 11 and about the administrative uh, um, expenses and the sash. And because I was so busy writing, I did not follow the third area of concern you had. Yeah, so the third area was more so, um, not so much a concern, Chair Mullen, but more a recommendation that in order to be able to meet our scale targets goals, we need to focus on actually having a true Medicare fixed payment. Right now it's a reconciled um, fixed payment, which essentially means it's just fee for service. Um, and if we really want to get to true fixed payments, we have got to start those discussions with CMS. And it's my understanding that they're telling us it's going to be an 18 month process. So I really would. So you're really talking about what you're hoping for us to be able to yes. um, try to foster a negotiation with the uh, feds to make a yes. change and not specifically about any condition. No, not at all. I just, I, I don't want us to lose sight that that's very important to our participants to get to that true fixed payment. And if we really want to meet scale, our focus has to be there before it is on commercial because that is a smaller piece um, of the the work and the total cost of care, quite frankly. Well, let's hope we can focus on both. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All um, right, thank you. So now I'm going to uh, open it up for the to the board for any um, comments or questions, and I will go in um, alphabetical order, beginning with the letter P. Tom Pelham, <laughs> you're on mute, Tom. Yep, I'm trying to get myself unmuted there. <laughs> well, thank you, and and thank uh, Marissa and Elena and Vicky for uh, the comments. Um, uh, I, I, I'll just start off with this uh, FPP issue that Vicki was just discussing. Um, my my concern is is that we don't have markers um, that tell us where we have to be when. And I'm kind of 
you know, uh, hooking on with Mike Smith, uh, Secretary Smith, you know, concept of rebooting and um, having everybody in the boat pulling in the same direction. And, you know, we know today um, that FPP is a foundational metric um, in the ACO process. It is the metric that is uh, designed to leverage cost savings and to leverage improvements in pop population health. And so I, I don't, I don't, and, and I know it is complicated. I understand, you know, that Medicare is a very big piece of that. But um, I think it's important to kind of lay down some markers as to where we are right now. And I know from the other, from documents that I've looked at that, you know, the hospitals that are about 13.9% of fixed, fixed prospective payments, and it actually reduced it a little bit from 2020 uh, budget to uh, 2021 budget, and that of the ACO's portfolio, they're about 33% fixed prospective payment. But I don't know what that means in the context of a more perfect world. And clearly, we don't live in a perfect world, but from a, a purely academic point of view, uh, I would hope that the ACO can look forward and say, inclusive of resolving the Medicare issue, this is where we want to be five years down the road, four years down the road, at some point down the road, so we know what we're working toward. And right now, we're just kind of, you know, going along, you know, and, uh, you know, these numbers appear, uh, like I just, you know, talked about in terms of, you know, the hospitals, uh, FPP and the ACOs, PP, but, but, but they aren't um, leading leading metrics that we can um, um, uh, focus upon. Um, and so as we go through a hospital budget review, as we go through rate review, um, um, I would think it would be very helpful to have those metrics in mind. I mean, maybe we are uh, hypothetically almost where we want to be to achieve the leveraging effects of, um, of and, and of the capitation for through fixed prospective payments, or may, maybe we're miles away from it. Um, and I just think that we need to, um, as, as is you know, done with many, many budgets to say, here's where we are and here's where we wanna be. And these are the things that we have to, have to um, address, including Medicare, including commercial, to get to the critical mass of FPP, fixed prospective payments that will generate the kind of savings and the kind of popular health improvements you know, we hope for and diminish uh, the reliance on um, fee-for-service. So I, I, it's, uh, and, and I'm not looking for, um, I wouldn't be looking for the ACO to uh, be responsible for this, but just to do the analysis that's uh, as the entity that is the mix master uh, in terms of uh, converting fee-for-service to um, a fixed prospective payments to say, you know, here's where we want to be as an organization. Here's where we want to be. Here's where we can be. You know, if commercial gets uh, addressed a bit and if Medicare gets addressed a bit, so that we have a guiding light that we're working for and we know how near it is or how far away it is. Thank you, Tom. Um, I I didn't hear a question in there, did I? Um. No, um, I, I might I might want to propose an amendment um, at some point, um, uh, you know, just just to kind of rework the wording on, on, on I think it's uh, slide 15 a bit. So my next area, um, uh, I, I can make a question out of it. You know, will the ACO, um, <laughs> you know, help, uh, you know, frame the FPP uh, context? Um, uh, in terms of where we are now and where we want to be at some future date. Um, my second uh, area is has to do with this benchmark plan, which I've raised for a couple of years uh, years now. Um, <clears throat> as we know that the QHP population is a key part of the attributed lives um, in the ACO. Um, and uh, the but the all the uh, benchmark plan on file at CMS, predates the ACO and the all-payer model. And if you look at uh, just the um, uh, you know, amount of premiums that we just went through in terms of rate review for Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP, they total $542 million of, 
of expenditure um, aligned with the plans or the, 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 the uh, QHP plans that we don't know whether or not those QHP plans are well aligned with our population health goals. We just, I mean, I know one, for example, that isn't. You, um, there is no pre-diabetes pre uh, treatment program uh, in the benchmark plan or in the, uh, uh, the, you know, the Blue Cross Blue Shield MVP plans associated with the benchmark plan. Um, and uh, that, and yet diabetes is one of the, you know, the, the largest chronic diseases that we're, we're trying to address. So what I would be looking for and asking of the ACO is, is they do kind of a clinical review um, of the benchmark plan as it stands now, the 2013, 2014 benchmark plan, um, and look at, at what it allows uh, and what benefits get paid relative to uh, uh, supporting population health um, and uh, uh, make recommendations to DIVA, um, who should be uh, the leader on this, but just to say, here we are, the ACO, we're out in the field, we have these metrics we're working for, and if um, the uh, uh, payments from Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP could be rearranged on an actuarial sound basis to uh, be more supportive of um, po our population health goals, that would be a great thing. And I especially think that this is timely in terms of looking at uh, the uh, effort to realign the blueprint um, uh, and with, with the self-management uh, programs. I mean, the blueprint does have a pre-diabetes program, um, which it operates on a shoestring um, that is the, the preferred uh, best, in, best in, in type kind of CDC program. But, but that is not a benefit that you can get now um, if, if uh, uh, you know, through a bronze plan or a gold plan or a silver plan. So um, my request would be for um, the ACO to advise, not demand, not dictate, but to advise, uh, spend some time clinically looking at the benchmark plan, looking at, say, the bronze plan, and saying, here's where uh, those, those plans match up well with what we're trying to do here in Vermont, and here's where they don't match up, and, uh, and then be, and let DIVA know that here are some opportunities for them to, um, uh, as Mike Smith says, have us all in the boat rowing in the same direction. So uh, that's, my, that's my request. My third area is, uh, question is, how much has the new uh, um, risk model, the kind of systematic risk model uh, with the 10% um, uh, um, <clears throat> kind of a reward for, uh, for, for achievement, kind of changing it from what they used to say with the mini ACOs to a system-wide risk model, how much has that been scrubbed with hospitals? Um, because I, uh, I mean, because uh, I, I don't think the uh, Vaz has spoken on this, and I, I just wonder. I mean, the the way the the uh, uh, slide is written is that we're going to adopt this and then find out about any adjustments we got to make in the spring. Um, but I could see hospitals not wanting to, you know, wanting to be kind of responsible for their own improvements and the savings associated with that as opposed to being part of a wide systematic system that is driven essentially by UVM and, and the network uh, where, um, uh, you know, where, where they are in a pool um, sharing responsibility with them. Uh, so um, I, I would just feel more comfortable with that if, if I knew what the hospitals have been exposed to with regard to that plan and uh, what their feedback is um, uh, before uh, you know it gets kind of too far down the road, and we find out it's not really what the local hospitals want. Maybe they do want it, and that would be fine with me. I'm not trying to prejudge them. I just want to make sure that they've been heard. So, Tom, it looks like Vicki Loner has her hand up and is prepared to answer your question. So, Vicki. Yes, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the question. It's a great question. Um, I wanted to say that I personally had conversations with every CEO and CFO that um, was part of One Care Vermont's network. We also brought this through our finance committees that has every single, um, almost every single CFO 
in um, the local hospital systems on that committee and it went through our board um, of managers which on our board of managers sits every hospital CEO in Vermont and they unanimously voted for this change because it will be better for their hospital system and we also provided them data as a part of this work to show them um, what it might look like for shared savings and risk opportunities going this approach. Um, and they were the ones also who voted on what the metrics would be for that 10% increase. So that's a long way of saying um, that they were very involved um, in developing and approving this approach. Well, thank you for that, Vicki. I know, I know a lot more now than I knew five minutes ago. <laughs> You're very welcome. Do you have other comments or questions, Tom? No, those are the three areas I'd uh, like to hear from other board members. Super, thank you, Tom. So next it's gonna be Jessica Holmes. Jessica? Hi, thank you so much. Um, first, a couple of uh, comments actually on Vicki's comments. Um, one was I support incentivizing participation in the all-payer model and in fact, allocating those blueprint trend dollars to the hospitals that are participating in the um, Medicare ACO initiative for the reasons that Vicki outlined. I just wanna make sure that those dollars extend to the practices that are participating in the ACO Medicare initiative as well, not just hospitals, but practices as well. And this distinction was actually made in Secretary Smith's letter to us. So I wanna make sure that that's incorporated. Um, I concur with the, the comments about having fixed payments for Medicare. It's certainly on the agenda for thinking about the next version of this model, but I also just wanna make sure that we are uh, also continuing to get more fixed payments in the commercial side of things. And, and a one care strategy is really important for that. So I wanna make sure that we're not losing um, that initiative as well. In terms of the overall conditions, which I think is what we're, we're here to vote on, um, hopefully, or try to vote on today, I wanna say that I support the conditions that are proposed by the staff. And I wanna, again, thank the staff for thinking through this. I know they've been working really, really hard on coming up with conditions. And as you know, Vicki had mentioned that you know the ACO is a new organization. Well, the board is evolving in its effect as a regulator of this new organization. So these iterations on the conditions and how we regulate are really important. And I feel like there's a lot of improvement here. I want to, the one area that I did want to speak about was on the admin costs. Um, and uh, there were a couple of uh, options there. So I've given this some thought and uh, I want to say that, first of all, I'm very supportive of asking one care to resubmit if their uh, delivery system reform dollars or the self-management funding is significantly less than anticipated. It's gonna require a restructuring of that admin budget, I suspect, since those are significant dollars coming in. So that I support. I'm also very supportive of increasing our understanding of the benchmarks used to set compensation. I think the board and the public should understand what compensation benchmarks are used, what percentile ranges are targeted when setting compensation, adding that benchmark condition is consistent with what we do in the hospital budgets and it would improve regulatory alignment. So I agree with that component. Um, I'm also supportive in principle of the notion of tying executive compensation to ACO performance. I think one of the primary functions of the ACO is to tie payment to value. So it makes all the sense in the world for the ACO to do the same with its own executive compensation. Let's reward the leadership team for achieving scale, for lowering costs of care, for improving quality and Vermonters can be assured that the ACO's leadership is being paid in a way that's consistent with the goals that we have for healthcare reform and aligned actually with the way that we're changing the incentives to hospitals and doctors. It's very much in the spirit of everything that the ACO was trying to do, so it makes sense. I do think though that if we think it's necessary and appropriate for an ACO's executive compensation to be tied to the organization's financial and quality performance, I think it's probably a standard that we should adopt through the rule for certification so I think that the benefit of doing this through rulemaking rather than the budget is that the rulemaking process has a notice and a comment procedure that's built into it. 
And you know, the review of rules looks at whether we have the legal authority to do what we want to do here. So if the requirement is properly adopted through the rule, it's going to have the force and effect of law. It's also going to apply to any ACO that seeks to operate in the state. It'll just be a standard that is applied to all ACOs that want to be certified. I know that the legal team has already been working on a revision to the ACO rule, trying to update some dates and doing some other things. So. I propose that we direct them to incorporate this requirement in their updated draft and provide us with an update on it by the end of January, so it's soon. So we really are moving fast on this. Um, the proposed rule change, I think, would serve as a notice to the ACO that this is a direction the board is headed and will likely be in effect hopefully by next summer if we can have the rule change implemented over the next few months. And in the meantime, the ACO can use that next six months to develop and implement a really effective pay for performance incentive that does help achieve the goals of healthcare reform. So I guess where I stand in terms of this condition, and again, I, I agree with all the other conditions, where I stand on this condition is that I would vote to approve option two, which cuts the administrative budget by the expense overstatements that were identified by staff and then direct our legal team to incorporate a new requirement in the ACO certification rule that executive compensation be tied to ACO quality and financial performance and to update us on that by the end of January. So it's sort of a hybrid of two and three, but it's saying let's do the executive comp through certification rule um, rather than through uh, this budget process. Did you have other comments or questions? No, nope, that's it. Thank you, Jess. Robin. Thank you. Um, so I think I'll start with admin because that's where Jess left off. Um, I've been also thinking about the admin options um, since uh, the staff came out with a couple different options last week. Um, I like the idea of incorporating the um, the tying of compensation to performance benchmark into uh, the new rule going forward. I think that that is a clearer way to do it and would apply, be clear that it applies to any ACO that may operate in the state. Obviously right now we have one, but um, who knows? Uh, I do like the idea of getting the benchmarks and um, I am concerned about the um, DSR and blueprint funds. When Vicki was here last week, it sounded like the blueprint funds were uh, less of a sure thing in the contract negotiation, so we'll have to wait and see. But together, those are 24% of the admin budget, which certainly is a big chunk. Um, so I think probably um, on which option, um, I would go with Jess's suggestion of, op of option two with pursuing the compensation moving forward in a clear uh, public fashion through the rule. Um, the other piece I'll just comment on, I do support the staff recommendations um, as I've been talking about since the October budget hearing. Um, at that time, I did indicate I was not uh, supportive of the level funding of SASH and Blueprint, um, which was described on page 34 oh. of the. Hello? You just cut out for a second, Robin. Maybe oh, you sorry. can repeat what you just said. Sure. Um, as I as I had indicated at the budget hearing two months ago, uh, I was not supportive of the original proposal to level fund Blueprint and SASH. Um, in the budget submission by the ACO on page 34, there's a description of the level funding. Um, and in Appendix 4.3, it's indicated uh, that the Medicare trending did not include a factor for blueprint, which certainly uh, perhaps it was the ACO did not mean to say that they were not trending for the MAPCP amounts, but that's certainly how I interpreted that. Uh, that note that it did not include a factor of, for blueprint. So um, I think part of the problem in this area is that the proposal has not been clear. And I still don't actually feel like it's particularly clear what the proposal is when it comes 
to SASH. Uh, when it comes to the blueprint, the statute is clear that the programmatic decision making is AHS. I'm happy to leave that to them in the ACO to work out what makes sense moving forward. Um, unfortunately, the blueprint statute is not clear on SASH. So I do think because those fun that funding is coming through our decision making that it's up to us to make decisions around that program, at least given the current statutory scheme. Um, with that said, I, I'll say, you know, if next year we get a clear proposal about how to allocate MAPCP, I'm all ears. I'm I am completely supportive of ensuring that we have alignment across Blueprint, SASH, and the ACO programs. In fact, I think that's necessary. Um, however, the proposal has not been clear, and I'm not on the last day going to change my mind when I've had, you know, there's basically been two months for someone to bring forward a clear proposal. Um, so that's just an explanation I wanted to, to say um, in terms of why I'm supportive of the staff um, condition around Blueprint and SASH and the specificity around SASH. Again, I am happy to hear a new proposal next year as long as it's clear and we understand where the funds are flowing to and from. Uh, so I think that's really all I have to say at this point. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Elena, could you put up the slide that deals with uh, Blueprint and SASH, please? Yes, one moment, please. So um, my question is for Vicki, and um, it's pretty clear that there's been a lot of confusion from the, the budget submission up to this point on exactly what was going to be trended and so on. And I heard you again today talk about um, wanting that trend to go to only those hospitals that participated in the uh, Medicare program. And so um, can you just be more clear on what your position is on the SASH funding? Sure, I, I can. So our position on the SASH is that it would be level funded, that the 4.35 inflationary rate would be applied to those communities that are participating in the Medicare program. And so that 4.35 would go to the community health teams. And the reason why I think what has evolved since this pandemic is that it's become very clear that the trend rate for the ACO participants will not be growing at a 4.35. In fact, for 2020 and 2021, we're probably looking at a negative trend rate. So that's why the position is due to this asymmetrical risk that's being created by these new benchmarks to provide the modest incentive to those who are actually bearing the risk in the program. And I think we have said we wanted to hold that money until the end, but understanding the board's concerns that they wanted to get this money out the door to support the blueprint, we can make those quarterly payments out to those that are participating. Is that is that helpful, Chair Mullen? Um, somewhat. Um, I, I think what I've heard from my colleagues, and it's certainly my position, is that as much as possible, this board would like to see almost every expenditure tied to benchmarks or uh, performance standards where things are met. And I see in the language here that what the staff has recommended is um, it would be contingent on the increase in funding being used to enhance programs or to expand access for Medicare beneficiaries. Vicki, do you know um, if there has been an increase in the number of um, Medicare beneficiaries that the SASH program will be serving for the coming no, they, year? No, they have set panels in our contract so that's why there's level funding. So they'd have to increase their panel sizes. So so given that um, there's been evaluations that have showed savings from the SASH program, have you created any incentives for them to increase their panels? Are, are, 
is there like a waiting list or? We have not, I mean, we have not seen or we have not been able to simulate um, the same level of savings that was done, I believe, um, pre all payer model. I believe it was 2010 to 2016 um, in, the, in the SASH participants. But that's certainly something that we would like to look at. Okay. Clearly, I think this is uh, an area that uh, we're struggling to uh, find consensus on and one that uh, maybe uh, members of the public might be able to help us on as well. But um, Elena, could you next go to um, the, I think it might have been slide eight or maybe it was slide 10, condition eight on administrative expenses. Great, you've got it. <laughs> and um, here, what I heard one of the board members propose is a hybrid model. Um, I would just say that I think that it's been a very uh, tough discussion, one that We've actually had um, in rate review and other processes before the board to um, limit growth in um, administrative costs. I do think that here, one of the bigger problems is what um, is actually defined as administrative costs. And so um, I think I am comfortable with what I heard um, from member Holmes um, as a possible solution. I just want to say though that um, at a time when many Vermonters are out of work and others are not getting any type of pay increases, um, I can see the uh, kind of momentum why people would think that, um, you know, people at the director level and above probably could take a year without a pay increase knowing that they did take a pay cut, but also had that reinstated. So the the uh, really onerous hit to the compensation has already occurred. And the, the problem with putting it off till after a rule is that it, it does nothing for this year's budget. But again, I can live with that. I, I think that there are other areas though that could be looked at and have been discussed in previous hearings that I, I really hope the ACO will pursue, such as the um, occupancy costs at the building. I, I just think it's uh, hard to see in, in the new world that's been created by this pandemic, the need for the office space that OneCare currently has. And I would hope that um, there could be creative solutions and realizing that there is stickiness to um, trying to make those changes. Uh, I wouldn't be looking for an immediate change, but just to, um, from me to everybody listening at OneCare, I think that that's an area where um, there's no additional value created to any Vermonter as far as um, better health care or lower costs um, by having, you know, um, what I would call not luxurious, but um, much more than adequate uh, space for the requirements moving forward. I think we all know that most people will be working in a hybrid model uh, going forward and that we've learned to do so much remote work that um, probably that size of space is probably no longer needed. Um, so I think there are creative ways that one care can find to try to reduce um, the budget here. And I think that it's, these are things that will take time and will take effort, but I would hope that the underlying um, framework of any of those decisions is based on which of our expenses create value to the goals that we're trying to achieve and which expenses are just, just that, just expenses that add no value to the goals of the mission that everyone is on. So, um, Tom, um, I think you 
um, referred to slide 15, or maybe it was condition 15, and maybe Elena, you could go to that. And um, I just want to fully understand what you were proposing there, Tom. So if if you might just be able to state it in what motion you would like to see there, and then I might have a comment on it after I think I fully understand where you're headed. Okay, uh, let me just add on to your let the end of your discussion on the administrative expenses. I re remember reading in some of the voluminous uh, material that we have that the rental contract for the coming year had a 10% kicker in it. Um, uh, if if the ACO decided to stay in its present, and we location. also <laughs> hearing that um, there was an April time frame of when um, decisions would be made, if you recall. Do you yes. remember that, Tom? Uh, well, I, I, I was just, you know, I was just wondering if anybody knew what the value of that 10% was. Um, Tom, it's $45,000. They factored okay. in a 26% increase um, because they, it wasn't super clear, but that's about the 11 111,000 increase you see in the budget with a 10% is really 45,000. Yeah, thank you. Um, so regarding slide 15, um, so the, I'm not the, the best drafter of uh, motions, but I would um, at the appropriate time wanna move that the ACO shall advise the Green Mountain Care Board as to the preferred level and critical mass of fixed prospective payments system-wide across hospitals that will achieve significant and meaningful cost reductions and improvements in the population health that may help guide the Green Mountain Care Board with regard to its responsibilities to review and approve hospital budgets and commercial rate increases. So what I'm trying to do is, is, is a pretty simplistic thing is like, here's where we are now where do we want to be and what pieces need to fall in place for us to get to where we want to be? I mean, we have a theory out there that the capitation embedded in fixed prospective payments will lead to innovation and reforms and cost savings. That's the theory. Okay, well, let's kind of put pen to paper and say, well, here's where we are in uh, 2020. We know where we are in 2020. Uh, we have budgeted for 2021. So how long will it take us to get to that critical mass? But I don't know what that critical mass is. Is it 30%? Is it 50%? Um, I just, you know, I, I, I don't know. But, um, but the ACO, as the kind of this, the point of the spear on this issue, I think should know. Um, and uh, at least should be able to put it uh, in an analytical form that we could say, you know, th this, this is the, this is the, track that we want to follow uh, and uh, and and then you know be able to work uh, through rate review and through the hospital budget process to 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 get us on track as much as possible. Thank you, Tom. Now I understand uh, what you were saying. So I think um, I haven't heard any feedback on other than those three conditions um, and I'll probably, when we get to the point where we're going to vote, try to take those up one at a time and um, solve the uh, differences and reach consensus from the board on how to move forward. But before we do that, I do want to open it up for public comment. And um, I would start first if any member of the healthcare advocates staff has any um, comments or questions. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I don't. We don't have a need to make a public comment at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and happy holidays. Happy holidays to all of you. So I'm going to open it up to um, the public for any comments or questions on the ACO um, budget with the proposed conditions as outlined today from our staff. Does any member of the public wish to offer any comment at this time?
So hearing none, I'm going to take up the uh, three areas that I, I see some uh, conflict still remaining on. And I'm going to start, Tom, with your uh, proposal on um, slide 15, if you could make that motion. OK, thank you. Um, I move that the ACO shall advise the Green Mountain Care Board as to the preferred level and critical mass of fixed prospective payments system-wide across hospitals that will achieve significant and meaningful cost reductions and improvements in population health, and that may help guide the Green Mountain Care Board with regard to its responsibilities to review and approve hospital budgets and commercial rate increases. Is there a second? <laughs> I'll second for purposes of discussion, and I may have a friend, what I hope might be a friendly amendment. <laughs> sure, let's hear your friendly amendment. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tom, I am reacting to the word shall advise because um, it rubs me the wrong way, given this is a regulatory process. I'm wondering if you would be amenable to changing it to a requirement that they work with all payers to propose the, the plan that you suggest and that they report that to us? So say that one more time, Robin. So basically, um, I think your, so what I was saying is that would you be amenable to having One Care work with all payers, not just commercial payers, but also obviously Medicaid uh, to and the hospitals and the other regulated entities to try and come up with that kind of a proposal, which then could be reported to us and we could have a discussion about it um, along with obviously AHS. Right, I think I think that's fine. I um, My intent uh, at the beginning was not to put the ACO in any kind of regulatory hot seat or, you know, kind of uh, developing a rule that we have all have to live by. It's just taking a stab at um, you know, a, a professional stab at um, uh, where we are now and where we want to be, but that would include um, all payers. Um, I, I, uh, I w did not mean this to be limited just to the commercial folks. Um, so I, uh, I think I, I accept that as a friendly, friendly amendment. Okay, is there discussion on the um, uh, motion as amended? May I just ask a question? Is it in addition to the um, the condition 15, or is it a substitute for condition 15? I don't. I don't I think, think they're mutually exclusive. I think condition 15 would be subsumed within the new requirement because the new requirement is basically looking to do both. Uh, clear goals and milestones around fixed perspective payments, but beyond more than just the commercial payers in a format that we could then look to use that information in this process as well as our other regulatory processes and our thinking moving forward. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I as I look at, you know, the slide, um, it, it seems a little tepid to me, you know, that the one care will uh, work with commercial payers, and I agree with your suggested amendment that that's it's broader than that. To propose a timeline for working toward higher levels, I'm not looking at a timeline. I I I want a, a number. I want them to come and say, well, we've we've done the best we can. We've talked to everybody. Here are the moving parts. We're at 13.9% in 2021, and we we believe that the minimum FPP rate needs to be. 37% or 35%. And 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 here's what here's here's how we can get there and here are the moving parts that have to be moved in, in order to get there. Um, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not looking for a timeline. I'm looking for uh informed uh assistance in, in understanding where we are and where we have to be. I guess I just want to make sure I think what I'd be looking for is a, a number, a strategy, and a timeline. So yes. All yes, three of those yes. components should be right. in there. Um, right. But I'm not so. looking for a, t a timeline to have to develop a strategy. I'm looking. Yeah. I agree with you, Jess. I mean, that's yeah. 
that's breaking it into its uh, appropriate parts. So if, Jess, if what, 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 was your, that. what were your three components, Jess? Well, it was a number, a strategy, and a timeline. So what's the ideal number across all payers proportion in fixed payment? What's a strategy to get there? And what is the timeline, a reasonable timeline for implementation? So maybe we should consider um, this as a motion to um, um, replace condition 15 and Tom and Robin uh, and Jess correct, um, correct me, but I think what I'm hearing is the motion is to um, one care must work with all payers to come up with a strategy number and timeline um, for meaningful fixed perspective payments in contract model design with clear goals and milestones. It, am I summarizing everybody's statements correctly or what have I missed? I don't think you missed it. I, uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think you missed it. I mean, the, the, the most important thing to me is where do we have to, where are we now, which I think we know, and where do we have to be in order to get the leveraging effect that we, that our narrative says is out there? And and assuming that that you know th that takes a critical mass of fixed perspective payments, what is that number? Um, but Jess is right that you know that's also got to fit into a timeline and a strategy. The number is the most important thing to me, but the timeline and strategy also makes sense. Can I just say one other thing, which is the the other way to do this um, is to pull together a stakeholder group and do it with all the stakeholders, which obviously puts more owner onerousness on our staff who would have to manage the stakeholder group. So I just wanted to, in the past, that was the mechanism that the board had used to develop this kind of thing. But I think either approach could work. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I, I think given this language, the ACO will have to consult with and talk to the stakeholders. I'm sometimes feel that the stakeholder process um, is, you know, is labor intensive, and uh, and and uh, just goes on and on and on because we got a lot of stakeholders. So. I, I'd rather just keep this within the domain of the ACO, which is uh, at the frontier of fixed perspective payments. So I must admit as the presiding officer, I'm not fully convinced I am uh, have the motion correctly. So um, Robin, do you wanna take another crack at it and see if uh, Tom agrees with what uh, the motion is? Of course, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, but I think you did fine. Um, that one care must work with payers to propose a, uh, a, uh, I'm going to call it a target, I fin a target for fixed perspective payment levels, uh, a strategy for achieving those levels and a related timeline um, with uh, clear goals, milestones, and uh, targets. Thank you, Robin. So Tom, I'm gonna to assume that was your motion and that Robin has seconded it. <laughs> Works for me. Works for me. Okay. Is there further discussion on the motion? Before we vote, can we hear from one care about whether this seems like a doable task? Or perhaps you were about to go there, Mr. Chair. That, that would make the most sense. <laughs> Vicki. I was just going to um, add that, you know, when you're talking about percentages, this, this hasn't been done before. Um, so to allocate a specific percent 
um, is probably an unrealistic expectation. We could certainly look at there's varying levels of risk. Um, there's four levels of risk that you can have in value-based care and increasing those risks over time. But I very much think this is ha has to be part of our strategic planning process um, to see where we need to be um, as providers in the value-based care chain and to which type of contracts we really need to be pursuing into the future. So I, I would just say um, this might not really sit well if it's not a really thoughtful process in terms of letting our providers um, know where they need to go um, and how they're going to get there first. So it seems a little premature before we've had any of our strategic planning, which will not begin until February. And I also just want to add one last thing is um, One Care Vermont doesn't have the ability to negotiate with the feds on the fixed payment. So that would be one area where the state would have to be actively involved in that discussion. So I just didn't want to lose sight of that. Yes, Thanks. definitely. Okay, further discussion from members of the board? Hearing none, then all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Uh, let the record show it was unanimous four to nothing vote. The next item um, to consider is um, the uh, trend for uh, both the blueprint and sash. If we could go to that slide, Elena. So again, um, I'm somewhat comfortable with this condition because it's tied to enhancing programs or expanding access. And I, I was wondering, um, Susan Barrett, if you are um, still on, if you could confirm that I'm accurate that in the correspondence that we had with SASH that they committed to doing more if they receive this? Um, I will double check that correspondence, but I had had um, discussions in the past with SASH directors, Kim Fitzgerald, um, that if there were additional funding, they would be able to increase capacity and expand. Okay. But I, I, let me check and see if it's in writing. I'll look at that comment while you're okay. discussing. Um, th the one thing for me is, um, I actually um, am fully supportive of what OneCare has proposed to um, make this available as an incentive for those that are participating in the uh, Medicare program. And I, I'm not as wed um, to the other increases given what we've heard with what the trends will be um, moving forward. Um, but I also hear strongly from my board members um, a, a very, um, passionate plea for the trend for SASH as well. So um, given the language that's in the condition, um, again, it's, it's just a, a very low comfort level, but I could also um, be persuaded that uh, it uh, the trend for SASH not be there. So I'll open it up for board discussion from other members. I've already said plenty, so I'm not going to say more. <laughs> well, would your motion be then to adopt um, this condition as is? Yes. I would is actually there... just do it as part of the motion to adopt the conditions in general, um, just because that will be a little bit more streamlined unless other people obviously unless I'm obviously in the minority and other folks want to move to amend it. I guess I have one question, um, which is I understand 
the desire by one care to um, incentivize participation in the Medicare ACO initiative on the blueprint side, I don't understand, I guess, why that incentive could not be carried over to the SASH side using the Delta, um, the trend factor component, the 4.35% 4 4 increase and allocating that increase to the communities that have chosen to participate in the ACO initiative. So Vicki, would you like to answer that? Sure, thank you. I, I think it's a matter of um, the fact that the ACO participants are not receiving that 4.35% increase in their overall trend. Um, so that's factor one that's very different from last year. Um, so this additional funding will have to be borne by those that are participating in the and providing risk in the program, which is the hospitals. So you're asking the hospitals to take on an additional $180,000, $200,000 of risk. I'd also like to add that this amendment doesn't say for those that are participating in the Medicare program and a large portion of the SASH participants are not participating in the Me Medicare program, nor are the communities. So the, their services, although are good um, and help the state overall, they're not helping to drive down completely the total cost of care that is being borne um, by those who are taking risk in the program. You're on mute. <laughs> Still can't hear you, Jess. She's on mute. Oh, sorry. I muted myself by accident twice. Um, do you have data or could you give me a little more detail on your comment that the majority or most of the SASH recipients are in communities that are not participating in the ACO Medicare initiative? Yeah, so um, if you look at the hospital service areas that are participating, um, I think it's six or seven. I'd ask Sarah or um, Tom to comment on that. Um, and so with the SASH funding, it is statewide. So you're asking us to fund those other communities that are not participating in the program. Right, but I guess I would have thought, for example, that Chittenden County would have been a major recipient of SASH funding, and that's certainly a one of the participants. So I wasn't. It, they, they are. When we've crosswalked those that are participating in the ACO versus not, I can get you some data. It would be older. It's it's not as substantial as you you might think. Okay. Thank you. Other board members? Um, Chair Mullen, this is Susan. I have, I just sent the um, public comment to you, but I can also just answer your question. Um, Kim Fitzgerald did have a public comment and she said if the, um, if the inflation was not applied to SASH that they would have to cut services, just to clarify. And that is posted on our website. So I'm not hearing anyone that uh, seems to have a desire to change this uh, condition. Um, so I'll just give it one last pause to see if any board member has a desire to make any change to this condition. If not, we'll move on. So hearing none, um, the, the other um, what I would call area of conflict is on the uh, administrative costs. And if you could go to that slide, Elena. And uh, Jess, I think it was clear that you had a motion that you wanted to make, so I'm going to uh, allow that to occur. Okay, sure. Um, I would approve option two, 
vote to approve option to move to uh, approve option two, which would uh, limit one cares administrative expenses not to exceed fifteen point five million dollars. Um, but this also is nine. Fifteen point nine, sorry. Um, million dollars, uh, but then also direct our legal team to incorporate a new requirement in the ACO certification rule that ties executive compensation to ACO quality and financial performance, and that they would provide us with an update on that proposed change by the end of January. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, is there um, further board discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that was a unanimous motion. So at this point, Robin, I do believe that you could make a cumulative motion. Great. Uh, I move that we approve One Care Vermont's 2021 budget with the staff conditions as outlined in today's presentation with a amended and replaced condition 15 and a amended and replaced condition 8, which is inclusive of the motions that were already voted on. Kevin? Yes, Tom. So I don't know where this one goes, but I, I also have a motion on the benchmark plan. I don't I don't know what slide to associate that with, but um, you know it, it you know somewhat r related to maybe slide eleven. But uh, I would like to make a motion to uh, regarding uh, a, a clinical review of the benchmark plan relative to our population health goals. Would it make sense to? to vote on the staff recommendation and then that could I, I guess I'd have to withdraw it because of the it was moving to approve the whole budget. So why Correct. would I do that? I, th I think that Tom's motion could be made afterwards. It it could go either way, whatever yeah. the, the board is most comfortable with. Well, why don't I withdraw my motion and we can address Tom's and then we'll do the okay. final. So Tom, your motion is? My motion is the ACO shall review Vermont's current benchmark plan on file at CMS relative to its clinical alignment with current ACO and all pair model population health objectives and advise the Green Mountain Care Board and the Department of uh, Health Care Access, Vermont Health Access, as to realignments that will improve population health while being actuarially sound. Is there a second? I'm assuming nobody's on mute. Um, and I'm not hearing a second. If I can just add that, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the rate review system this year for the QHP populations was $540 million, almost a half a billion dollars. And if that expenditure is not aligned and it might be um, i know in terms of pre-diabetes it's not but if that expenditure is not aligned with what we're trying to do with the aco and the all-payer model then it, it it doesn't make any sense to me i mean to me this is low-hanging fruit that um and that the the expenditures on the qhp plans which we also approve um should be well aligned with uh, our um, health care reform goals and uh, they just haven't been visited in 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 you know since uh, 20, 2013 but <clears throat> I'm not so I would just chime in to say I'm not opposed to the ACO doing the review but 
having done a review like this before, it's not cheap and it requires actuarial support. And so the reason why I chose not to second it is because I, I think there would need to be a cost estimate associated with it. And, um, and, you know, an understanding of where that's coming from in the budget and what it's replacing. So that that's my main reason why I didn't want to second it, Tom. I don't disagree with you that it would be helpful to have them weigh in when AHS moves forward on a new benchmark plan. I think that would be very helpful. And certainly they could be more assertive with that if they'd like to be. But I just don't, you know, we last time we had federal exchange funds and it was, I don't remember the exact contractual amount, but it was not cheap. So that I just am not comfortable requiring it without understanding the price tag and where the money's coming from. Yeah, I just want to agree with Robin. To me, it feels a bit like an unfunded mandate that I don't know what the cost implications are. And it's a big lift potentially. And at this late point in the budget process, I don't feel comfortable imposing that without understanding of what the consequences are to their budget. Well, I can understand. I can understand that a little bit. Um, it's it's you know I just look at pre-diabetes, and if you go to the bronze plan and you know their treatment for Joe that as they advertised for diabetes is seventy six hundred bucks a year, and then you've got the blueprint out there running these work workshops for a thousand bucks for a number of people in a workshop, and uh, you know if if this were $20 million or $30 million in benefit expenditure, I might agree with you, but this is a half a billion bucks. And uh, for for that not to be aligned, especially for the QH population, which by and large is attributed, um, just makes no sense to me. And I'm hearing some rumblings that DIVA might be um, beginning to uh, look at this anyhow. Um, so it would be better to have this resolution in play uh, um, than not, um, uh, just to make sure that the whole alignment issue, um, uh, isn't, uh, you know, <clears throat> it, it isn't lost. Um, I, to, to me, this is, in a, I mean, from a fiscal point of view, from a population health point of view, it just makes common sense. And, uh, I appreciate what Robin's saying. Everything does cost money, but, uh, you know, maybe the ACO, we could accept this and have the ACO come back with a, a budget estimate or something. I don't know, but. Um. So, uh, <laughs> the chair always hates to uh, second a motion, and I'm a little bit reluctant to um, here without uh, knowing what those costs would be. I did see some hands go up for public comment, and even though we don't have a, a seconded motion in front of us, I would like to um, hear from those, um, uh, especially from the healthcare advocate and from OneCare, and um, we could move forward from there. So, um, uh, Mike Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I only know enough about this to get myself in trouble, but uh, I'll just say out loud that I believe that DIVA is uh, indicated that they are interested in applying for a grant to um, look at the benchmark. And um, at least they indicated that to us recently uh, around other advocacy. And so maybe some of this could be accomplished with some communication to DIVA if they're doing so to include some of this analysis. Thank you, Mike. Um, Vicki? Yes, I was just going to echo what board member Lundgren Holmes said, was that although I do understand that this is important work and we're always happy to provide input, that um, part of the AHS implementation improvement plan was for the ACO to focus on its core responsibilities. Um, and this seems like one that should lay um, within the scope of the Agency of Human Services and not one care. Thank you, Vicki. I also saw a hand up raised by, and I'm not sure the full name of this person, but it says Steve Guest. So our guest, Steve. Hey, uh, Chairman Mullen, can you hear me? I can. Is this Steve Gordon? Yes, it is, sir. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> um, so I want to apologize for coming in a little bit late to the uh, Zoom call. I was on a call with VDH on uh, 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 the vaccine program down here in Brattleboro. But uh, I see the slide that was up about SASH and uh, the blueprint. And I just want to express my concern that if, if our goal uh, for one care in the state is to um, expand the number of hospitals as part of one care, having kind of unfunded um, increases in uh, uh, programs like SASH or the Blueprint or any other programs um, is not going to be an incentive for the ho other hospitals to sign. As you know, we're, we are one of the six that have been participating in all the programs at One Care. But um, we're going to find it more and more difficult if, if um, we're required to um, fund other programs uh, without having increases in support um, uh, from the state. So I just want to uh, express that. I know you kind of you already covered that as part of your uh, presentations and, and a vote, but I, I was a little late to the to the game, but I wanted to share that with you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank Is you. Is there any other um, comment on Tom's proposed motion? Uh, Kevin, one, one more thing. I, I would see it as a friendly proposal if the amendment were um, uh, or if the uh, motion were kind of mild, uh, revised a little bit by saying the ACO shall subject so, Tom, to the why don't, uh, why don't you withdraw the motion you made and offer another one? Okay. Um, so um, I would like to withdraw the motion I made um, and uh, substitute it with this. The ACO shall subject to available funding review Vermont's current benchmark plan on file at CMS relative to its clinical alignment with current ACO and APM uh, population health objectives and advise the Green Mountain Care Board and the Department of, of Vermont Health Access as to realignments that will improve population health while being actuarially sound. Does any board member wish to second the motion? Well, I'm sorry, Tom. It's the holidays, but um, there is no second here. <laughs> Not the first time. <laughs> so with that, um, Robin, if you could uh, um, go back to your motion. And again, I would just say that if anybody wants to take another crack, at um, slide 15, um, not slide 15, um, dealing with the, the SASH and Medicare trend. I, I tend to um, agree with the comments made by Steve Gordon and have some concerns, but um, I can read the tea leaves um, where this is headed. So I guess, uh, Robin, go ahead and make your motion. I move that we approve the ACO budget 20 fiscal year 21 budget with the staff conditions as outlined in today's presentation with a revised and replaced condition 15 and a revised and replaced condition eight as voted on uh, today. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to uh, approve the uh, conditions as uh, amended um, today regarding um, slide 15 and regarding the um, administrative expenses. Is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, and since this really is uh, the approval of the budget, I'm going to open it up to public comment one more time. If anybody from um, One Care, the healthcare advocate, or any member of the public wishes to make a comment, please proceed. Mr. Chair? Yes, yeah, Susan Aronoff? Uh, yes, this is Susan Aronoff. First of all, um, happy holidays to everyone. Happy holidays to you as well. And um, I just want to propose something. I would really urge the board to do this. Um, it really varies but amongst administrative bodies and different sets of rules. 
when a body like the Green Mountain Care Board issues responses to the public comments that they've received. And the Green Mountain Care Board to date has received a lot of public comment on this year's budget. Specifically, um, Julie Wasserman's public comment, which was refer referenced in Patrick Flood's commentary, um, makes a lot of really valid points. And so this isn't really a comment on your vote that you're about to have or on the merits of funding SASH or Blueprint, but the overall value of this whole endeavor to um, the citizens of Vermont. And I think that it could enhance the credibility or the perception of the Green Mountain Care Board if the board itself took the comments of people like um, Julie Wasserman or myself when I submit mine or others seriously enough and respectfully enough um, to respond to the comments that have been received. And so I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot now, but I just think it's something, Mr. Chair, that you and the other board members and your staff might want to consider doing. And sometimes I've seen regulatory bodies um, catalog the comment received and have some general comments. Sometimes I've seen them go point by point. Um, I just think that there's a difference between not commenting at all. It sends a message, I think, to really just to not comment at all on serious public comment that's received and you know to go line by line and comment on everything so i would just encourage you um you know after the vote and after your staff get some well-deserved rest and holiday time um to think about responding to some comments because you yourself mr chair you know last year you said one care you got to tell a better story and so now you know they're on vpr in the morning advertising and it seems kind of odd to me but I don't really think Vermonters have any better sense now than they did a year ago of what one care is, how it impacts them for better or worse <laughs> or anything like that. And um, there's just so much stuff, content that gets put out there into the ethers and we don't get to hear very much from the Green Mountain Care Board as the Green Mountain Care Board um, about these very weighty issues. So I would just like to invite, encourage, <laughs> request some response from the board um, to the public comment that's been received on the One Care budget and on um, the Green Mountain Care Board's oversight of this uh, vast enterprise. So thank you and have yourself a very good holiday. Thank you, Susan, you as well. Any other member of the public who wishes to comment? Hearing none, is there any further discussion from the board on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. Uh, Mike Barber, if you could call the roll since it wasn't unanimous. Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Member Pelham? No. Mr. Chair? Yes. So let the record know that uh, the budget with the conditions has been approved on a on a, a three to one vote by the Green Mountain Care Board. Elena, Marissa, and the other members of uh, staff who have worked so diligently on this, um, I know because uh, we've had the uh, after dinner conversations, how hard you have been working. And I just want to say that um, every member of this board is very grateful for the uh, the amount and the effort of work that you put into this. And quite frankly, um, we couldn't do this without you. And so thank you. And uh, I'm actually, um, surprised that we were actually able to vote today because I felt in my gut that it might be next week. And so it's uh, probably best for everyone to move forward 
on trying to do everything that's necessary to, to make this program work for Vermonters and to really um, hold everybody's feet to the fire on making sure that um, the goals that um, this program is trying to achieve are achieved so that we can improve access to uh, care. We can um, really um, try to create a better life experience for Vermonters through better health and try to keep people from getting to um, full-blown chronic illnesses. And so um, with that, um, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. And I'll just say that um, I had created a tradition of uh, wearing my um, uh, Snoopy um, Christmas hat and playing the music, but because of the seriousness of today's uh, votes, I opted not to do that again. I didn't want anybody to think that um, I was not taking today seriously. Um, but I do want to wish everyone um, a, a very joyous holiday season. And I know it's going to be a different holiday season than everybody is used to. Um, but thank God through technology, we can still have these um, visual calls with our friends. And I've heard very, very positive um, comments and feedback back from a number of hospitals in the state of Vermont that talked about how the morale of the healthcare workers had been trying. And, um, you know, they were troopers, but um, there was definitely fatigue being weighed in. But once they started administering the uh, vaccinations, um, in fact, one hospital CEO said it was almost like the faces were faces that you would see at a party, smiling and cheerful. And so um, it's gonna take time, but we are on the road to getting back to whatever that new normal is. And just reach out um, through the phone if you can to anybody that you're concerned with over these holiday periods, because we know that um, not everyone has the family or friend infrastructure to um, keep an eye on them. And we also know that one of the outcomes of this pandemic is going to be increased strains on, on mental health. And so, you know, just keep everybody in mind. If, if you have a neighbor that is um, living alone or struggling with some type of health issue, maybe put a plate of cookies on their front door and ring the bell and leave. Um, but just with that, happy holidays, and um, thank you everyone for uh, the work that's been done today.